Shout out to Big Hurt. My man's from day one. A1 day one. I grew up poor just like everybody else. Every black man that's successful out here got some type of uh, rags to riches story. So basically, I'm no different. You know what I'm saying? So we grew up poor, me and my brother Ronnie, Glenn, and you know, we didn't have anything. You know what I'm saying? We didn't have, you look in the refrigerator, it was roaches. You look in the, the, the drawer, it was roaches. Sometimes we had to uh, steal money from our moms, you know what I'm saying, out of our pocketbook in order to get things to eat. It wasn't to buy drugs or to buy weed or to, you know, go play. It was survival, really, real talk. And she was a good mom at a certain point until, you know, she got to experiment maybe with drugs or maybe with just alcohol or however maybe. You know, I've never seen her do drugs, but yet she had, uh, you know, tendencies or, you know, things that would make you believe that, you know. So, you know, we went days without eating. You know, we would visit our dad and we'd find out who he was and they would, you know, we would go over there to his house and his family and we would see them eating all the time and you know we coming from where we come from we didn't eat like that all the time so we developed a sense of not being hungry so they used to say wow y'all y'all not gonna eat oh, wow y'all not eating this you know what i'm saying and we was looking at them like y'all pretty greedy man <laughs> you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. y'all eating three four times a day that's greedy Bro. yeah I had to go through the neighborhood where I grew up at and shit. It's my man's uh, bone right here. He knew me before I was penitentiary tattoos. <laughs> All right. To the DVD, man. Keep the show, man. What up, dog? You know, bone. I'm still around here on the block. Ain't nothing changed, motherfucker. Get for sure. All right, baby. Acorn possible. Acorn <laughs> possible. <laughs> You know, so it was a uh, it was a blessing, you know, to run into our real father, and he took us in, and, and uh, you know, showed us the way of uh, you know how life is supposed to be. You know, we got everything we wanted. He bought us cars, clothes. You know, our father was a good father, man, and um, I learned a lot from him. My father owned his own security guard company, and it was called Samuel's Protection Agency, and. Um, with Samuel's Protection Agency, I believe he had uh, 73 employees, man. And um, we, um, you know, I, I just saw that, and I saw the revenue that my father was bringing in, and it excited me. You know, it sparked something in me, like, I want that. I want to have this business. I want to grow up one day and own this business. So I watched my father very carefully, you know, and I seen checks for $65,000 at one time. And, you know, and this is not coming in once a year. This is coming in weekly. You know, and I was fascinated by that. And uh, I think that's what sparked my entrepreneurship at a young age, seeing my father. And um, made a few mistakes in life that led to incarceration. And, um, what happened was, you know, I met a young girl or whatever, and uh, she would tell me that her stepfather was molesting her and raping her at, uh, you know, different times or periods in her life. Um, when she was 11 years old, an occurrence happened, um, maybe two, you know, 13, you know, at different points in her life. And uh, I would ask her, like, wow, you didn't tell your mom about this, and why is your mom still with this guy? And she had some type of excuses. Whatever the case may be, I love this woman, so I believe you, you know what I'm saying? You will believe anything that somebody tells you that, you know, a loved one tells you. So, um, you know, um, I would see the guy, the stepfather, because she lived with him, and um, I would immediately turn my nose up at him. You know, I didn't like this guy. I wanted to fight this guy. You know, I, I just couldn't understand why this guy would do something to somebody he's raised with, you know. So, um... One thing led to another. She called me one night and said, hey, you know, he held me down on the bathroom floor and raped me and stuff like this. And, um, and I lost it, you know. I, I got on, I jumped in the car, went over there and shot the guy point blank range. You know, and, uh, 
a lot of people ask me, do I regret it? And I say, no. Even during all the years of incarceration, they gave me 10 years of doing that. Um, no, I didn't regret it at all. Because I felt like, you know, if somebody hurts your family or, or harms your family, of course you want to do something in retaliation. Only thing I do regret is not thinking to maybe use another means of getting back at this dude maybe or something. I probably could have used a baseball bat or something, but, you know, I believe he had something coming, you know. But uh, nobody deserves to be shot, maybe. At least that's what I'm supposed to say after rehabilitation days. But anyway. Shout out to my nigga Izzo. Izzo in this motherfucker house. It called, we have a word in prison, it's called two years and out. What that means is when you're in prison for about two years, your family members, they're probably going to send you money, they're going to cater to you, they're going to, oh, I miss you, I miss you, but after two years or so, it gets kind of old. So you're probably faced to deal with yourself. You're going to have to develop some type of hobby, some type of uh, hustle, or some type of means to support yourself, becoming a man. You know what I'm saying? Um, I believe prison saved my life. I got a lot of obituaries from friends that I know I was hanging with, you know, and would have been hanging with at that time. So I believe prison saved my life. So during my incarceration, after three years or so of not receiving any income from the family, you know, whether they're doing bad out there or good, but, you know, it's out of sight, out of mind. So I, um, I sought out means of of monetary, you know, uses. So I, I, uh, I start drawing. You know, I drew on cards. I drew on envelopes. Um, I gave them to people and say, "Hey, how you like this? Oh, I like it a lot. Hey, let me buy it." I'm like, "Whoa, okay, cool. Um, let's do this then." Start drawing up stuff. They liked it. You know, give it to you for two dollars. Give me some soaps. Give me some deodorant or whatever. You know, whatever the case may be. And I got a, a bunkie that was doing tattoos, and I was fascinated by the money that he was bringing in from that. Now that really sparked something. So I asked him, I said, man, could you teach me to do that? Because I want this type of money that you get. And he taught me, and I was very successful at it. I, um, I was actually getting titles to cars. I was tattooing a guy, and the guy would be like, hey, all I got is a... You're not got a car at home, you can have the title. I'll call my people, hey, go over there to such and such house, grab this title. And they'd grab it. You know, so um, I would, um, I paid off a girlfriend student loans from prison. Um, I would send money to girls that I liked it just so they could have gas money to come visit me. You know, I did it all from prison. You know what I'm saying? If it was a such thing as popularity in prison, I was it. Um, they um, gave me a nickname in prison. I was called Tookie Williams. You know, I was pretty big and solid. You know, I don't work out anymore, but, you know, used to be pretty big and solid. Um, you know, Roy Jones, you know, they called me that because I could fight real good, and he was pretty popular around the time of incarceration. Um, you know, I got locked up from 98, and I was released in 2007. So, upon um, my release, um, it was very difficult to find a job as a person with four felonies, two felonious assaults, a felony firearm, and assault with attempt to commit murder. So no one would hire a guy like me. You know, I'm, I'm out here, I'm swole, I got veins in my face and arms and full of tattoos. And I'm like, hey, can I wash dishes here at, at Denny's? And they're like, no. <laughs> so, uh, you know, hey, McDonald's, no. T-Mobile, can I help you, you know? So, different things like that. It was very, very hard to get a job. Um, a couple people took some chances on me uh, because I forced myself on them. I literally showed up to a, uh, a welding plant and I told them, hey, I'm not doing nothing every morning, but out here looking for a job. Can I do something here for you? for free. You don't have to pay me. I'll be here every single morning like a regular employee 
and you don't have to pay me a dime because I don't have nothing to do but sit at home in my parents' basement and play video games. The man said yes. I worked in that shop for about two weeks straight, no pay, no nothing, cleaned up, learned how to weld by watching other people, and gave my, and then they gave me a job. And they also offered me money and I still wouldn't take it because I wanted to be true to my work, what I said I was going to do. They hired me in at $14.25 an hour. That was pretty big money for a guy just getting out of prison. Um, I had um, immediately, i probably say a month and two days of being in my parents' basement, I moved out. I got my own house off of the income that I was receiving from that job. Um, relationship problems, had a lot of them. You know, I had good money coming in. Women was using me left and right because I was allowing them to use me. Because being in prison for 10 years, no one knew who I was. No one paid me any attention. So to get out of prison and have money and have women, it felt good to be used. I wanted to be used. I welcomed it. So it was something that I wanted to do. Um, the job ended uh, due to bankruptcy or however it may be. Um, and I was left without a job and I had a home. The only thing that came to mind was tattoo. That's what I did in prison, you know, that's how I got myself through. So started tattooing. Started tattooing in the kitchen, started tattooing in the basement, wherever I could do it. And I was bringing in money that was pretty good. I was making about $300 a day. And uh, it just got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, you know, to the point to where I just had to get a shot. Open one shop, open another shop, open another shop, open another shop. Now I'm sitting here with three tattoo parlors, and you know what I'm saying, and, and the list goes on. Cars, homes, everything. You know, I've only been out for four years and three months now, you know. Uh, beautiful wife, two beautiful kids, you know, summer and winter. My wife got real, and God has blessed me with everything I probably could want. So, you know, and um, I go to schools and try to talk to the kids. You know, I adopted an art class, you know, pass out book bags, anything to give back. And the name Penitentiary Tattoos is, you know, I'm not trying to capitalize on the word itself and try to make people believe that, uh, you know, go to prison and, you know, and do good. I'm using this name as a means to show people that a negative experience can turn, I turn it into a positive movement, you know what I'm saying? I would like people to know that, you know, this is where I came from, this is the situation, this is the situation that, that I rose up from, the rose that grew from concrete type thing, you know what I'm saying? I never forget those nights in prison where I laid on that bunk and, and crying and wondering when am I going to get out or what am I going to do, you know, things like that. So it's a constant reminder of those things to me. You know, a lot of people don't like the name penitentiary. You know, Caucasian people, they say, uh, I don't want a prison tattoo, you know, and then yet, you know, go to church and, and say things like, you know, don't judge a book by its cover. Get to know the, the man behind it. You know, this, this DVD I'm putting out is so you can get to know who I am, you know, and, and therefore you won't judge me or judge the name of the place and you come in and get good quality work. We do good quality work, you know, at all my shops. I created a workplace for people to, um, to get a job, you know, as an artist that came out of prison. You know, say if you, you've, you've got into some trouble, you have any felonies, or you, you're out of prison and you know how to tattoo, you know how to draw, you have a home here. You know, I won't hire you unless you have a felony, or unless you've been to prison. You know, because I believe we're the best of the best. And that's real. And I mean that from the heart. We are. I've seen guys in prison that can jump from the free throw line and dunk better than Jordan. But you would never know it because this guy, he's never getting out. So the ones that are getting out, that have talent, I'm going to help you out. You come here. You always got a place here. Um, I run this place or my, my tattoo parlors. Um, I have a no bitch assness policy. And what that means is 
we don't do a lot of hand holding in here. You know what I'm saying? This is prison. You're not gonna hold hands. We're not gonna be screaming and crying. You leave that outside. You know, we don't we don't want that in here. Only reason being is is tattoos it's tough, it's painful. When you get in your car and you say, hey, or you get on the bus and you decide, hey, I want a tattoo, you're deciding to make a decision to to have some sort of pain or discomfort in your life. So why complain about it? Don't get in this motherfucker and complain. This is a motherfucking house of pain. This is what we do. Man the fuck up. Woman the fuck up. Real talk. Welcome to prison, bitch. That's my slogan. That's my motto. Stand by it. Um, also, the artist is here. They have the ability or the, the will or free will to do whatever they want. If you walk in here and you want a little heart with a little moon, a few little stars, if Joe Smo, the artist, don't feel like doing that tattoo because he's tired of doing hearts, moons, and little stars, he ain't going to do it. He's going to refuse you. And I may refuse you too because it's just certain things we just don't want to do. I don't want to do that no more. I get to pick and choose what I want to do. I'm a boss now. These guys are bosses. They all work with me. These are my co-workers. They're not my employees. I always refer to them as co-workers because just I'm, I'm the only one that has the overhead. I got to pay all these bills, true enough, but without these guys, can't nothing get paid. You know, I can't do it all by myself. So it's a teamwork. It's, a, it's, it's, it's co-op. It's co-workers, not employees. And I got 11 of them. We're damn good. We're really good. Um, and that, that's basically in a nutshell how this place works or how my shops work. You know, and we do good quality work. Unbelievable work. You know, uh, for dirt cheap. You know what I'm saying? The economy is not where it used to be 10 or 20 years ago. And it's, and it's going down still. Why pay $65 for a name? $75 for a name or three little letters or something like that when the economy is so high right now. I mean, it's so low right now and, and, and people don't have money like that. God gave me a gift. God gave me a talent or craft and I'm trying to master it. I'm trying to share it. I want it. I want my artwork on everybody. So why take something that God gave me and make it so uh, unattainable that the, the common man can't reach it? You know, a common woman can't reach you. Um, I can't get next to this guy because it costs too much to see this guy. It costs too much to get in this guy's chair. I'm called, I'm what's called a hood celebrity now, I've heard. I don't, you know, I don't per se, I don't really like the title. I mean, but it is what it is. Uh, people see me everywhere and say, hey, hey, you know, like they know me. Hey, welcome to prison, bitches. You know, that's East End, West, Flint, everywhere I go. Free food if I want it, you know. So it's... Why make something so so they can't reach me? Why make it so a person can't reach out and touch me and say, hey, or well, come sit in my chair? That that's that's unbelievable. I just don't I don't understand that. I really won't. And uh, of course I gotta work harder. I may have to do three tattoos in order to get sixty-five dollars that this person probably can just make in one person. You know, but he may tattoo one person a day and I may tattoo twenty and end up with more money than he has with that one person. Like I say, those are starving artists. And um, we are Detroit's only, only licensed tattoo bar. That's it. It was three. It was Pitbull, 5150. I guess 5150 Customs downtown Detroit. I guess they're working some things out. Shout out to Nemo. That's my best friend. Um, he may be selling the joint, I have no idea. But um, out of all the shops that's in Detroit that you see, we go around every last one of them. Um, there's probably 53 of them, including the East and the West. None of them have a state license. A state license is like having an Oscar. You know what I'm saying? That's when they come in here and they do all the evaluation. They check the floors, check the ceilings, spore tests and the, uh, the autoclaves, make sure you're you're a sanitary working environment that's not going to get people infected. I'm not going to get people diseases. Uh, I'm not, you're not going to get sick when you come to penitentiary tattoos. You're going to be well taken care of. You're going to be in a sterile environment, and that's by law. State license. Look it up. 
address is 10380 Gratiot Avenue, Detroit, Michigan, 48213. Get it right. Do your research. In conclusion, I would like to say that God is good, you know, and um, He's, you know, it's amazing. You know, I'm not a person that goes to church a lot, uh, but I do believe in giving back. You know, you may see me in a drive through at White Castles or something. I'm going to pay the order behind me and take off. You know, that, those are the things that I do. Or you see me in the grocery store, I'm buying your groceries. You see me at the gas station, I'm filling your tank up. You know, not because I'm trying to get to heaven. It just feels good to give back. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, don't, 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 um, just, you know, if you're out there and you're trying, you're thinking about a business and you've been thinking about it, thinking about it, do it. Step out there. Walk out. You know, step out on faith. Uh, when, you know, like Jesus, the guy that called him, you know, Jesus called the guy out there out of the boat, you know, walk on water with me, you know what I'm saying? The minute you took your eyes off the Lord, you started sinking. So don't take your eyes off of the prize. Don't take your eyes off of the business or your goals. Keep going forward. The scariest, the hardest thing in life is working without a safety net. I mean by that is quitting your job. When you decide to rely on you and only you, and you look back and say, hey, I got these kids and I got this wife, and everybody's relying on me or you, that's the hardest thing is convincing yourself that you can do it. You can do it. If I can do it, you damn sure can do it. That's all I got to say about that. And I'd like to welcome everybody to prison, bitches.